Welcome to The Cap, where we are here to speak with college reps and other professionals in the field of college admissions to help answer all your questions and guide you through every step of the process. So if you're serious about college admissions, you've come to the right place. Are you ready? Let's talk about it. And now, here's your host, Dr. John Durante. Welcome to The Cap, the college admissions process podcast. I am your host, John Durante. And I am here to introduce you to college admissions representatives and other professionals in the field of college admissions. Our purpose is to serve you, the students and parents, so that you may gain insight straight from the people who ultimately make the decisions, regardless of whether you will apply to a particular school being highlighted in a given podcast episode You should listen to all of them, as each guest will give you tremendous insight and advice on every aspect of the college admissions process. Lastly, if you have any questions you'd like me to cover on future episodes or any comments you'd like to share, please email me at collegeadmissionstalk at gmail.com. And don't forget to visit our website at www.collegeadmissionstalk.com collegeadmissionstalk.com. So are you ready? Let's talk about it. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. I am your host, John Durante, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome today Haley Smith, who is a recruitment coordinator for the University of Michigan. Haley, how are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me on today, John. I really appreciate it. Excited to chat the admissions process with you today. We are so happy and feel so fortunate to have you today, and we are all truly looking forward to this conversation. Thank you again, Haley. So why don't we start by just asking you, Haley, to tell us about yourself. How long have you been in admissions, and how did you end up in this position? Absolutely. Thanks for that question. Um, To start off, uh, again, my name is Haley Smith. Excited to be here with you all today. I've been in the admissions world for about four and a half years at this point. Um, I work at University of Michigan Ann Arbor currently in the Office of Undergraduate Admissions. My undergraduate degree is in education and my master's degree is in talent development, also known as organizational training and performance management. I started working in admissions at a smaller university for approximately two and a half years. It was a private institution. And then I transitioned to the University of Michigan, and I am currently in my second year here. I started during the pandemic, so it definitely has (laughs) been an adventure, but enjoyed my time. Um, I am now a recruitment coordinator for training and professional development within the office, and I also have specific territories. I have an in-state territory, the Michigan, Ohio border counties, and then I also have an out-of-state territory, Long Island, New York. Well, thank you so much for that intro, Haley. So let me ask, despite the obvious, incredible athletics, outstanding faculty, a school rich in history and so many great traditions, located of course on a stunning campus with state-of-the-art facilities in beautiful Ann Arbor, what is it about the University of Michigan that makes it so appealing for so many students to want to apply? John, thanks for this question and echoing all of the positive things that are happening at the University of Michigan. I think I could talk about this question for hours just because there are so many good things happening on campus. And I think one thing that really attracts students is the collaboration between students on campuses throughout the different schools and colleges. Oftentimes students will ask me, is the University of Michigan a competitive environment? And my answer is no, it is a collaborative environment. We have 14 different undergraduate schools and colleges on campus with over 280 majors. That's a lot, a lot of different options that students can choose. So really no matter where your interests lie, you're likely to find a good fit within a major at the University of Michigan. We have the College of Literature, Science and the Arts, the College of Engineering, the School of Nursing, the School of Kinesiology, the Stamp School of Art and Design, the School of Music, Theater and Dance, and the College of Architecture and Urban Planning. And within all of these different areas, oftentimes students are collaborating with one another. You might be a history student within LSA, and you might have an engineering student within the College of Engineering and a Stamp School of Art and Design student all working together on a different project. 
We also have our upper level programs as well. We have the Ross School of Business, the School of Dentistry, School of Public Health, School of Education, the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy, School of Information, and College of Pharmacy. So many different areas that students can get plugged into on campus. And through that, one thing that makes it really unique and special at Michigan is that collaboration between the different areas. We also have over 1,600 student organizations on campus. Wow. That is so many different options for students to get plugged into, many different areas. And with that, if you don't find one that you like, guess what? you can make your own as well on campus. And so I know you alluded to a lot of our top things, so I'll end it there. But I think really just the special, when you walk on campus, when you walk into the big house for the first time and go to your first football game, it is an experience that you will never forget. That all sounds terrific. And obviously I know a lot of students who are currently there and have graduated and they all just love the University of Michigan experience. So a, a, a big thank you for all that you guys do to get the right students there and to keep them very happy. In fact, I read a statistic that 97%, 97% of the freshman class remains, which is just an astonishing number. So congratulations on that. Absolutely. What does a typical year look like for a college admissions counselor? And how many applications do you actually review a year? Yeah, great question. So each one really runs in a typical cycle that follows the admissions process. The fall really focuses on school visits, talking with students about the college going process, and then of course, assisting students to prepare to meet those deadlines, that early action and regular decision deadline. And then once we get into the late fall, winter, we really transition to focusing on application review. All of our applications are read at least twice in our office, so we really start ensuring that we're going to be meeting those application deadlines to release decisions on time. The spring then transitions into working with admitted students, doing yield programming, you know, really showing them why Michigan could be a good fit for them, and then to some junior programming as well to help those juniors start thinking about, you know, why am I interested in college? What am I looking for? And then we transition to summer. This is really gonna focus on preparation for the year to come. Start thinking about what is that fall travel season gonna look like? Hopefully we'll start to get back to a little bit more normal. A lot of it this past year was virtual, but we're hoping to get you know more boots on the ground as we transition to fall. And in between that, there's all the different institution needs that we're completing um, throughout those main priorities. Well, that's great. Thank you so much for sharing that. Absolutely. And in regards to number of applications, it really depends from year to year, depending on the volume that have been submitted. Um, We do review by specific territory. So like I had mentioned, I have an in-state and then my New York, Long Island territory. So those are the specific schools that we focus on. One thing I want to point out in our review is we review within the context of the specific high school. So we're not comparing one high school to another high school. We understand all high schools have different curriculums. My job as that admissions counselor is to make sure that I understand, you know, what's offered at Syosset or whatever I'm reviewing so we can review within the specific context of that high school. Well, thank you for giving that insight. I know that's very helpful to a lot of students and parents out there. So appreciated. With more schools going, test flexible, and the ease in which students can apply to multiple schools, thanks, of course, to the Common App or the Coalition App, what shifts have you made in your admissions process with the increase in student applications? And if I may add, what is the average profile of the current freshman class? Absolutely. I'm going to start with the second part of your question. So first off, we have students that are represented from all 50 states and over 100 countries. So receiving a lot of applications from a wide variety of areas. In 2021, the average GPA was a 3.9. And the test score, if submitted, we're going to talk about that test flexible policy here in a minute. It was a 1400 to 1540 SAT or a 32 to 35 ACT. 
With that being said, we have what is called a holistic review process where we're reviewing all areas of the application. We have been doing this for years. So I think to your point of how it shifted, um, I will point that out here in just a second, but we really have six different pillars within that holistic review process. We're looking at GPA, we're looking at curriculum, we're looking at test scores if they're submitted. If they're not submitted, then we're looking more heavily at that GPA and curriculum piece. And then we're also looking to get to know the student. We're looking at extracurriculars. We're looking at essays, letters of recommendation. So really looking at all of those six different pillars through that holistic review process to understand, is a student going to be a good fit for the University of Michigan? Our test flexible policy will continue through the 2023 and 2024 recruitment cycles. More information to come on years down the road, but we do have that secured for the next two years at least. Well, that is so good to know. And we'll certainly unpackage some of the other items that you mentioned in terms of what goes into the overall holistic approach. I was curious, does legacy play a role in your decision-making process? In other words, if a student's parent attended the University of Michigan, does that help an applicant in any way? Yeah, that's a great question. I get that one a lot. Um, <laughs> legacy is not a deciding factor within our holistic review process. We have over 630,000 alumni within our alumni wow. network which That's is a amazing. huge amount. And so with that, students are able to note on their application where their parents attended college. So if it was the University of Michigan, they can note that, we'll be aware of it. There's also a place if you have a grandparent tie or a sibling tie that you can provide that information on the application. So it is there available for you to put, um, but not necessarily a deciding factor. Well, thank you for that clarification. I really appreciate it. What advice would you give a student if they fall lower than the current freshman class's average? Should they apply and what can they do to improve their chances? Great question. I still encourage students to apply because we don't have a minimum requirement for GPA or test score. We have that holistic review process. So if a student maybe really struggled during their ninth grade year, but they had a really strong 10th and 11th grade year, we would consider that an upward grade trend. And so that's something we would note within that holistic review process as we're reviewing applications, just as one example. So I encourage students, don't be deterred by those averages. Um, we admit plenty of students above and below those averages each year. Thank you so much for that. And I know that the University of Michigan is test flexible, but I was curious, if a student chooses not to submit their scores, how does that affect their overall application? And are they still considered for merit-based scholarships? Yes, students at U of M who are applying through that test flexible would still be considered for merit-based scholarships. In regards to the review process, it's that really that holistic process will be focusing more in on GPA and curriculum. Are students challenging the curriculum that's available at their high school? That might be taking honors courses, it might be taking AP, IB, um, dual enrollment, looking at all of that information as well. Do you conduct on-site or virtual interviews with prospective students? And if so, what advice would you give a student preparing for those interviews? Yeah, we don't conduct interviews as we receive far too many applications to be able to do that. We really encourage students to use their essays as their platform to share their unique voice, really showing why are you interested in the University of Michigan. There are three different essays that students will complete. They'll complete the common application or coalition essay. There are multiple prompts to choose from. Doesn't matter which one you pick. I just encourage pick the one that you're most passionate to, to write about. So then when I'm reading it, I'm excited to read that essay. We also have the community essay talking about a community that you're a part of and the why Michigan essay showing us why are you interested in the University of Michigan. Great advice. Thank you so much for that. And what about if a student applies early decision? Is there a better chance they will be admitted? Again, what advice would you give a student considering applying ED? Yeah, here at the University of Michigan, we have early action. And early action is non-binding. So if you are admitted to the University of Michigan, you get to pick if you want to come or not. Of course, we hope you become a Wolverine, but it's up to you. <laughs> and our early action deadline is historically November 1st with our regular decision deadline being February 1st. A lot of times students ask, what are the difference between those two? 
The big difference is early action, you're guaranteed a decision back by the end of January. Regular decision, you'll have your decision back by early April. So I encourage you, the sooner the better, aim for that early action deadline so then you're guaranteed that decision back by the end of January. Um, applications are reviewed through the same process in early action or regular decision, so that does not waver. The big difference is when you're going to be hearing back. Well, thank you so much for sharing those dates. That's extremely helpful. You made reference to college essays, so let me ask, what are some examples of college essays that really stuck with you? In other words, when you read them, you thought, I really have to meet this student. Absolutely. So college essays really stand out in the process are the ones that are being written from the heart and they're unique. I do not encourage students to try and take a high school essay and turn it into your college application essay. <laughs> start from scratch. Really start brainstorming. Think about what do you want to tell these admission counselors. Um, this is really your time to shine. Really show us why are you interested in U of M? What could make you be a good fit? A big tip, make sure all three of your essays are done well, because oftentimes what will happen is I will read the common application or the coalition application that's going to all of your different schools and universities, and it is glowing. It is amazing. I can tell you spent hours on it. Then I get to the Y Michigan and the community essay, which are our specific essays, and they're only a couple of sentences, and I can tell you really didn't put that effort in for those last two essays. So put 100% effort in all of your essays. When you're working on your Why Michigan essay, students often ask, well, what do I include in that? Start doing your research. Really figure out why are you interested in Michigan? Are you interested in a specific major? Is there research going on campus? Maybe there's a specific club or organization. Maybe there's a specific athletic event that you want to attend. There's so many different reasons why students can be interested. So I encourage you really hone in on why you are interested. Don't necessarily talk about your alumni ties or things like that. We see that on your application. <laughs> it's good to be aware of, but why do you want to come to Michigan and why are you going to be a good fit are really good ways to put into that. Um, you know, as I'm reading it, I shouldn't be able to plug in another college or university and it makes sense. It should be that specific to Michigan. Well, I think that's great advice. If the university is asking a student for supplemental essays, students, please take the time to answer them completely. They review every part of the application. So again, Haley, tremendous advice. Thank you so much. What about in terms of the teacher's letters of recommendation? What are you looking for to help get a better picture of the candidate? And again, are there any examples of letters from teachers that really stuck out that you could share? Yeah, first off, make sure when you're looking at teacher recs, start thinking now who you want to write that teacher letter of recommendation and make sure you're giving them enough time before those deadlines we just talked about to get it in on time. At U of M, we only require one teacher letter of recommendation. Can you submit extra? Yes, but only one letter of recommendation is required. So really think about who you want that one teacher to be. Are they from a class where you struggled, but you overcame? You were going to study sessions every day. You were working closely with that teacher and you did your absolute best work to achieve the best grade you could. Are they a teacher who's an advisor of a club? They can speak to maybe different strengths. They can talk about you inside of the classroom, but also that club or org that you're involved in outside of the classroom. Are they a teacher who's had you for a few years and you've really built a strong connection with and they've seen you grow from ninth grade to 11th grade? Um, in regards to letters that stand out, oftentimes it's teachers that are really talking about an insight to students' strengths, ways they've been proved. You know, strong insight is helpful from that teacher. We're not looking for that cookie cutter letter of recommendation. We really want to get to know why you would be a good fit at Michigan from that academic standpoint. Maybe they've talked a little bit about a club or org too, and that's okay. Um, but really focus on focusing on that academic side as well. Again, great advice. And thank you so much for that insight, Haley. Truly appreciated. How often should a student visit the campus and do you actually keep track of such things such as campus visits or, for example, how often they open your emails and <laughs> whether or not they engage with those emails in terms of clicking on embedded links that might be in there? Is this something you track to help see the student's level of demonstrated interest? 
You're exactly right. We call that demonstrated interest, <laughs> and we do not track specific demonstrated interest at Michigan. We do offer campus tours. They're back up and running. Would love to have you on campus if you're able to get out to campus. Um, I believe getting to different college campuses is really a great way to start understanding if they would be a good fit for you. With that being said, you may not be able to get to all of the campuses that you're interested in, and that is okay. I think a silver lining of the pandemic is there are a lot of virtual resources out there nowadays where you can go and virtually view a campus on their website. So make sure you check those out too. Like I said, we don't track specific dem demonstrated interest here at the University of Michigan. As we understand, all students may not be able to get to campus. Understood, and thank you so much again for that insight. Every admissions officer receives a copy of the prospective student's transcript and, of course, the activity sheet. What kinds of things are you looking for when reviewing these items? First off, let me point out, we receive transcripts from all over the world on all different grading scales. There's four point grading <laughs> scales, five point, there's even a hundred point grading scales. <laughs> and so when we get those transcripts into our office, we put everyone on what is called an unweighted 4.0. And what that means is an A, A minus, A plus is a 4.0, a B, B minus, B plus is a 3.0, so on and so forth. And then really looking at curriculum. Are students challenging themselves? We understand curriculum's gonna look different within all the different high schools, but maybe you're taking honors courses. If your school offers AP, IB, maybe you're, you've maxed out on that or your school doesn't necessarily offer a lot of those classes. Maybe you're going to a local community college or university and doing dual enrollment courses. Those are all ways to challenge your curriculum within the context of your specific high school. Also looking at extracurriculars, we're really looking at quality over quantity. Have you been committed to an activity? Maybe you have a leadership role within that activity, but thinking outside of the box, do you have a part-time job? Are there specific family responsibilities you have? Those are all things you're doing outside of your school day. Those are things that you can include within that extracurricular section that I think sometimes students don't oftentimes think about as being an extracurricular, but it is. You're spending time either helping with that family responsibility. Maybe you have to pick siblings up from activities and things like that. Maybe you have a part-time job. Those are all things that you're dedicated to outside of your school day. I really appreciate that you're mentioning family responsibilities and part-time jobs, which I agree. They all fall under the umbrella of extracurricular activities. And I also love how you talked about doing something with quality and not so much worrying about the quantity. Great advice. Thank you again, Haley. What kind of scholarship opportunities do you offer for academic achievement? And does a student have to apply separately for any of these offerings? Absolutely. First, I'm going to start with financial aid. So at the University of Michigan, you will complete the FAFSA and the CSS profile for financial aid. Some schools just require that FAFSA, but we do also require the CSS profile. So by going through the application process, completing those two financial aid documents, most scholarships you will automatically be qualified for just by going through the admissions process, completing those docs, there may be some additional opportunities. So if you are admitted, I always encourage students, take a look at the specific school or college that you applied to. They may have separate applications, but those are few and far between. A majority of them are just by completing those processes. We do have a five steps to scholarships page, which is a great resource. It really talks you through all of the steps to be qualifying for scholarships. We also accept outside scholarships, but one plug that I always put in is if you are applying for outside scholarships, they should always be free. You should never be paying for an outside scholarship. So that's just a little bit of insight to our scholarships. Definitely encourage you to check out our financial aid page too to learn more. Fantastic advice. And if there are any links, Haley, that you would like to share, I could certainly put them in the show notes regarding financial aid, regarding admissions, Anything that you want to share, we could obviously put the links in our show notes. How do you evaluate varying state assessments? For example, New York State has Regents exams for all of their students. Your school is, of course, outside of New York State. So how much weight do you put on these types of assessments? 
we do not consider region exams during our review or any equivalent examinations from Michigan or any other state. Um, you can submit ACT or SAT scores if you choose to, maybe submitting AP or IB, um, but we don't specifically look at those region exams. Perfect. Thank you so much for that information. And lastly, what other advice would you offer prospective students and their parents who are starting the application process now? Absolutely. This is one of my favorite questions, and I'm really passionate about starting to research the college going process. It's important to start looking at what is out there. Um, John, can you guess how many colleges and universities there are across the country? <laughs> so as you might imagine, I'm doing a lot of research, and I believe I read somewhere that it's somewhere in the 5,000 range. So there are over... 3,500 colleges and universities across the country. Okay. There's over 4,500 <laughs> in the world. So I bet that's where you're getting your stat. Um, but a lot of different options to choose from, right? That is an overwhelming number of colleges and universities. And so it's really important to start finding your right fit. So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions that you can start thinking about as you're going through the college going process. Do you want a large or a small school? What type of environment do you want to be in? Urban, suburban, rural, or an online setting? What type of school do you want to go to? Community college, a vocational school, a four-year college or university. When you're starting to research and think about these things, there's a lot of subcategories between those larger categories that I just talked about. So what type of institution? Are you looking at a public institution like University of Michigan, a private institution, a residential school? So University of Michigan is a residential school. You can live on campus or near campus, or are you looking for more of a commuter school where you would potentially live at home and then commute to college every day? Again, that size piece. Are you looking for a smaller school, a mid-sized school, a large institution? Where do you want to go to school? Do you want to stay in the state you're living in? Do you want to go out of state or do you want to go internationally? What is the academic reputation? What are the program rankings? What type of job placement are those students getting once they're graduating from that institution? Majors is a big piece that's talked about. And so what major are you interested in? It's okay if you don't know. But what options are those schools providing? And we're going to get more in depth on that one in just a second. Admission requirements. What is that school or university requiring you submit? Do they have a specific GPA or ACT or SAT requirement to get in? Do they have a holistic review process like Michigan? What is the student profile? What is the diversity of the student body? What activities can you get involved in? Yes, academics is very important, but it's also important to find those connections outside of your academics to get plugged into as well. If you're looking for, are there intramural sports? Are you interested in student government, Greek life, study abroad, so on and so forth? Is that school offering what you want? Of course, it's always in the back of our mind. What is the cost? What is financial aid going to look like? There is what is called a net price calculator. Lots of schools and universities have them on their financial aid website. They can be tricky to find sometimes, but I encourage you, dig into that website, find that net price calculator. Oftentimes you're going to see what we call that sticker price. You'll also hear it called sticker shock of like, oh my gosh, how am I going to afford this institution? Well, typically once you complete those financial aid documents, once you go through the scholarship process, that price is going to start to go down and it's going to become what's called your out of pocket cost. And so looking at that net price calculator can start to give you an idea. I encourage you, don't X out a university just because of cost. You never know. As you're applying, as you go through the admissions process, you're going to get a financial aid package where you can really then determine, is it going to be a good fit for you and your family? The success of students, you alluded to this at the beginning. What's the retention rate? What are the graduation rates at that school that you're looking for? And then the last piece, which is really important, is what academic support and other supports are you going to have when you're going to that institution? Oftentimes, you're doing really well in high school, Many students will think, oh, it's going to be an easy ride. I'm going to go to college. I'm going to be good too. And oftentimes, even the most successful students, they need academic support 
to transition into that college world. Um, I know I personally did. So check and see what are those support systems. So many different things to start considering as you're looking at colleges and universities. One question that I get asked a lot is what is your most popular major? And I'm sure you've asked institutions this, but I'm gonna challenge you back with a question. What are you interested in studying? Because that is important. Let me give you an analogy. If you walk into an ice cream shop and you ask, what is your most popular flavor of ice cream? And the ice cream clerk's response is mint chocolate chip. Guess what? I don't like mint chocolate chip. Are you going to pick that? No, you're gonna pick what you like. I'm gonna pick the chocolate chip cookie dough because that's my favorite. This analogy applies to college as well. You want what you want in a college or university. It may not be the most popular thing that's there, but it's what you want to do and it's what you're interested in. Go into your search looking for what you are interested in, not what is the most popular. Don't pick the mint chocolate chip ice cream. Pick what fits your needs, wants, and goals. After all, it's going to be your college journey and your college story, not somebody else's. So make it unique, make it yours, ask those specific questions, and really start diving into what are you looking for so that you can find the right fit for that college or university, one of those over 4,500 in the world. That was an incredible Hansa Haley. Thank you so much. I love the ice cream analogy. I love the fact that you talked about looking at the school, not only based on its reputation, but for example, the academic supports that they offer or not, the size of the school, the location of the school. Thank you so much for the information regarding overall cost. That was awesome. And most importantly, students, I hope you listen to when Haley said, it's all about what your interests are, yours and yours alone, not your friends or anyone else's. Enjoy the process, enjoy every moment. Haley, I cannot thank you enough. It was an honor and an absolute pleasure to hear you walk us through the college admissions process. Thank you again. Thank you so much for having me. It has been an honor. Students, if you all have questions after today, don't hesitate to reach out. Admission counselors are here to help and support you through the process. So no matter which college or university you're interested in, I encourage you, reach out to your counselors. Ask those questions so you can start to learn more. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Haley. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please don't forget to tell a friend and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and wherever you listen to your podcasts. I am your host, John Durante, and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of The Cap.